Hello, good afternoon and welcome everyone to our favorite seminar. Um, today we have two seminars for the price of one again, so because uh, um, sort of Gavi is, is presenting, of course, but uh, this is um, used both as a seminar in the greater series as well as in the external seminar series of the uh, of, of computing in Leicester. Uh, so we'll have a potentially mixed audience today. Um, but in any case, uh, so this is a, um, an ex a continuation of the tutorial, um, uh, which may turn into a series of, of tutorials if you find another sort of interesting thing to focus on um, that, that, that I started a few weeks ago, um, which is based on a book that Gabi and I wrote on graph transformation for software engineers, as you can also see in the title. And I looked at the sort of foundations and, and basic concepts. And this one is now on um, applications, sort of slightly more generally, but also then specifically looking at one particular application, I think in a bit more detail. Um, and um, I mean, if you, if you, if you look at the, uh, the, 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 the preface of the book, um, I can't remember where it was, but, but in, the, in, in the book somewhere we say, and this is true that um, it's taken a long time to, to develop this. Um, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm probably right in saying that the idea to write this book is probably from the last century, uh, if not uh, maybe early, very early this century. And I think it was first announced after that idea was discussed between a few people who were involved at, at, at the time, including um, Hartmut Erich. Um, it was first announced, I think, in 2002 or something like that as an ICGT in, in Rome. And then it's only taken another sort of 17 years after that to, or 16 years after that to, to, to finish it. So, so sometimes good things take a long time, um, but we finally made it. And, and um, yeah, as I said, so this is the second part based, based on that. So uh, yeah, please, uh, Gabi, you want to take over? Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Then I take over and uh, Raiko gave already a nice introduction to the book. And um, so what you missed uh, was part one by Raiko. Uh, this was a greater seminar on January uh, 14th. And uh, this was uh, an introduction to graph transformation in a, yeah, let's say informal or semi-formal way. And uh, actually, Raiko talked about the first uh, two chapters of the book, so graphs for modeling and specification and um, the basic graph transformation concepts. Um, he had not the time to go um, into uh, the um, yeah, topics of uh, chapter three and four, so uh, beyond individual uh, rules where control structures for rule application are uh, introduced. And, um, also not chapter four, where analysis techniques and improvement techniques for graph transformation systems are presented. Um, anyway, so I also skipped that, <laughs> but anyway, um, I will use part of it. And um, that part which uh, will be used um, will be explained by me. So, so don't worry if you do not know these uh, chapters or the topics in the chapter. Yeah, and now um, I will go over to um, part two. And part two is dedicated to applications to software engineering. And actually part two is a larger part of the book. Um, so chapter five to 12, yes. And um, so what is it about? And uh, here you see already um, a little picture on uh, agile software development, which is yeah, the modern style of uh, software development. And usually in agile software development, you start with um, the development of a core system. And uh, this core system yeah, uh, can already perform the core functionalities of the system, of a software system you have in mind. And then uh, you, you iterate a software development and in each iteration, new functionality of the system is uh, developed. And in each iteration, we have the typical task to do. So this is 
uh, requirements analysis, software design, implementation, validation, so usually testing. And uh, in our book, we show how uh, graphs and graph transformations can help in uh, these uh, software engineering tasks. And um, because when you develop software, you have a lot of different structures at hand. So for example, um, object structures or software architectures, network technologies, and so on. And so in the book, we develop something we called a graph transformation based software engineering, which is a kind of model based software uh, engineering and having a lot of different um, uh, using uh, different kinds of models. Um, so let's go further. Sorry. Just hmm. ah. so there's some animation, and uh, at first I have to understand how this <laughs> works here. So um, yeah, so it is normal to use in when, when you do model uh, model based or model driven software development. It is normal that you use uh, different kinds of modeling languages, like uh, the ones you see here, and even yeah. You can also consider programming languages as, as a kind of um, modeling language. And, uh, but here you have the usual perfect perspectives. Uh, so these are UML or um, business process modeling or um, feature modeling or patronage or something like that. And uh, yeah, such uh, languages have to be um, defined in syntax and semantics. And graphs can also help in that uh, direction um, as they provide a direct but um, yet implementation independent representation of um, structures of modeling structures yeah and this uh, leads to what we call uh, graph transformation based language engineering which is here and uh, part two of the book um, yeah is uh, dedicated to both kinds of uh, software engineering. And um, the yeah, now in, in today, I um, focus on the lower part, so on graph transformation based software engineering and not on the language engineering aspect, but you also find it in the book. So yeah focusing more into that direction, so into um, software engineering. Um, we have again this uh, cycle for agile uh, software development. And um, now um, we can uh, place the topics of the chapters of the book um, at these topics. And uh, so you see here, um yeah the topics of uh, chapter five to nine and i like to say a few words uh, to each of them um so this uh, part two starts with um a topic in requirements analysis this is detecting inconsistent requirements and uh, this is actually the topic i want to develop today together with you so i will go into details here and uh, but not into details of the other chapters so a short overview in chapter six um, we are concerned with uh, service oriented software systems and the idea is here that um, to find remote services so for example web services a service request is formulated and uh, then it um, has to be matched to specified services and uh, graph transformation can help to do the service matching. In chapter seven, um, we um, talk about model-based testing and uh, yeah, use test models to systematically test a software system according to some criteria. And uh, graph transformation can be used to provide test oracles and also uh, we can use uh, conflict and dependency analysis to um, check uh, certain dependencies of uh, operations in systems. 
Uh, in chapter eight, uh, we consider reverse engineering. The idea is here to present a dynamic approach of reverse engineering of uh, Java programs. And um, the result is a graph transformation system, uh, which uh, yeah, models the observed uh, changes in object structure. And uh, so um, this model could be used uh, for documentation uh, purposes, for example, um, for documenting uh, service specifications or APIs. Yeah. And in chapter nine, um, we support or we present a stochastic analysis of dynamic architectures. This is um, also yeah, based in software design. And uh, uh, this is to check non-functional requirements of a system based on stochastic graph transformation. So from chapter six to nine, this is what I will not talk about today, but uh, I will talk about detecting inconsistent requirements. So what is the idea here? Um, so I hope you know some requirement specifications for software systems. This is usually done with uh, natural languages or let's say uh, more uh, precisely, um, you have a, a document um, where the requirements are specified in a structured way, but they are described by natural languages. So this is the usual starting point. And uh, we describe uh, the objects and relations of a system. We describe functional units in form of use cases and um, describes the use cases uh, more closely by uh, activity diagrams, for example, or yeah, some process modeling, um, have different kinds of user roles and views on the system. And of course, in such a specification document, you also find non-functional requirements. And having described all of that, um, yeah, it can happen that uh, certain kinds of inconsistencies occur in the description. And the question is, uh, what types of inconsistency can occur between different aspects of requirements uh, uh, descriptions? And once we know what kinds of inconsistencies uh, can occur, is there some automatic or semi-automatic procedure to find uh, positive or negative signs of consistency. So this is, um, yeah, yeah, let's see how, how we do it. Okay, um, so what are the steps to get uh, this, uh, to get to this goal? Um, so as I said, uh, we start with a specification of requirements in natural language and um, usually, uh, yeah, this uh, specification is uh, structured in use cases. Here you see two use cases as ellipses. And uh, for the use cases, uh, certain roles, certain user roles are identified. So, uh, and then the use cases are usually described um, in natural language. What we want to do is to um, deduce some models from these uh, descriptions and then to check uh, consistency between uh, the different kinds of models we have. And in the end, all the, yeah, all what we have modeled is integrated and uh, transformed into yeah, a system description. Let's have a look at an example. So as an example, we use a kind of uh, shop and uh, describe requirements for um, buying and selling goods in, in a shop. And uh, so this example is here very small to fit on one slide. Of course, usually it should be much larger. Uh, what you see here is uh, are two roles, a customer and a clerk, and uh, two use cases, buy goods and sell goods. And uh, both use cases are described by some natural language as you see below. Yeah, so the, the customer takes a card and selects all the goods 
from the, from the shelves, and then they want to um, the goods they want to buy. Uh, an invoice is then created, and after the purchase, the uh, goods belong to the customer. So, and um, the selling, so for also for selling, there's some description. Uh, the seller uh, issues an invoice and puts all the goods of the customer on the invoice. Then they close the invoice and collect the money. And the goods uh, now belong to the customer and no longer to the shop. So the, both are very short descriptions and a lot is missing, um, but this is what we can write down here on, on one slide. Yeah. So what kinds of uh, models uh, do we want to deduce from the natural language uh, description? And um, we see them here in an overview. Uh, first of all, we want to know what, what kind of objects do we have and, and what kind of relations do they have? So what are the structures of uh, these, these objects? And uh, so you see it on, on the right side. Uh, this can be described in the end by a class diagram. And uh, so this is a structural aspect of the, of the requirement uh, description. Uh, then we have um, yeah, a description of the processes. We have seen it already on the, on, on the previous slide um, by use cases. And the idea is uh, we want to uh, look closer into the use cases and want to refine them um, through activity diagrams. Uh, you could also think of some, some process models, so some, some other kinds of process models. And um, then finally, uh, we even want to look closer into the activities. Um, so here, for example, take card and want to understand uh, what kind of pre and post conditions do these activities have? So what kind of objects have to be there to, to perform this activity? And uh, what are the changes that uh, this activity uh, will do? Okay, so I hope most of you at least um, know how um, how the struct, uh, static structures um, here shown in a class diagram can be deduced from from natural languages from, from a natural language description. So this is something you typically learn in. Uh, in an introductory course on software engineering. And uh, so usually it's done in a way that you uh, go through the text and identify nouns and you identify adjectives and uh, the verbs. And uh, from the nouns, you did use uh, class candidates, so to say, and uh, see uh, if you might have different nouns which uh, where the meaning is, should be the same, but, but the naming is different um, and, and other obstacles. But in the end, you, it's here for, for our example, we can identify, uh, for example, customer and, and a bag and a, a bill, a shop and so on, goods. And uh, yeah, also the adjectives, um, which are now here, uh, shown as attributes. So a good has a value and the customer has cash and so on. And the relations in between the customer uh, has a card and the card carries goods and so on. Yeah. So this is uh, something which is well known which, and which is the first step to get a model from um, uh, requirement description. Uh, once you have, so you even can can get the cardinalities from the description. Yeah, so that the customer uh, takes one card, but not more than one, for example, or can um, the bag can carry um, arbitrary many goods <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, and uh, a possible state of the system. Uh, can look like this here. So this is a very, very, very short, uh, uh, very small shop, sorry. And um, 
what do you see here? You see one shop with two goods only and uh, a customer with a bag and a card and there's a bill and on the bill, uh, both goods are on the bill, yeah. something like that. So one possible state. Okay. And um, now we uh, take this, uh, the next step and uh, look again at the use cases. And uh, yeah, you remember we had the use cases buy goods and sell goods and uh, we uh, refine them. And uh, buy goods is uh, refined by first take a card, then select goods as long as uh, the customer likes to do this and then pay the bill in the end. And sell good um, is, starts with creating a bill, then billing each good as long as there are goods, and then settle the bill. So we have here a refinement of each use case uh, through an activity diagram. And uh, so, yeah, let's see where we stand now. On the one hand, we have a description of the static structure by a class diagram. On the other hand, we have the description of the dynamics by uh, these activity diagrams. Are these activity diagrams consistent with the class model or with the class diagram? How can we decide that? Yeah, <laughs> good question. We cannot, huh? because uh, we just describe the dynamics here, take some names, but there's no explicit relation to class diagram right now. So we have to think about uh, how to do this. And uh, the next question is, are the defined processes consistent to each other? What does it mean, yeah, consistent? Um, is it possible that uh, they are both um, executed independently of each other or are there some dependencies? So if we look at each of the activities um, and we think about what um, might happen there, yeah, um, we could think, okay, um, we can build a good only after it has been selected, for example, yeah. or we can um, set a, a, or bill a good only after the bill has been created. So there are some dependencies. There might also be some conflicts between these activities. We do not really know. So, and actually there are different types of inconsistencies. Um, so let's see what, what kind of inconsistencies could occur. So um, the dynamic and functional uh, requirements in the activity diagrams uh, could use terms that do not appear in the class diagram or that has been named or redefined there. So we do not know if this really fits together. And um, yeah, the execution of activity diagrams can be unclear or can violate some constraints of the set static model. We don't know. Um, for deciding that, we have to describe the activities uh, closer. So at least we have to give the uh, pre and post conditions so that, that we can talk about um, the, the, the structural part of the system and can find out if there are some inconsistencies. Um, then there might be inconsistencies between processes and uh, functions. So once we have described um, an activity diagram closer, so have, have refined that, it might happen that the control flow, which is uh, defined in the activity diagram, does not match with the pre and post conditions of the contained activities. Yeah, and um, inconsistencies of views. Uh, these views would be described by different sets of uh, use cases. And it might happen that 
um, the use cases uh, do not really fit uh, together. Yeah, we will get to that later on again. So coming back uh, to what we have described in models so far, so static uh, requirements in class models, um, optionally also with some constraints, and the dynamic requirements by use cases and um, their refinement uh, through activity diagrams. And now there is an idea to relate these uh, static and dynamic uh, requirement descriptions uh, more explicitly using functional requirements. And uh, these functional requirements are pre and post conditions of activities. What does it actually mean? Um, so let's have a look at the first use case, the buy good use case. And here's a, 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 the refinement of it in, in the uh, right upper corner. And uh, for each of the activities you see there, so take card, select good, and pay bill, um, we now model the pre and post conditions by graph transformation rules. And uh, you see the rules um, below. So for take card, for example, we describe that um, there has to be a customer and there has to be a card. And uh, the customer has not already a card. And the action is, so the post condition is that the customer has a card. Yeah. So the pre and post conditions are together described by the rule. The precondition is described by the um, left hand side of the rule together with some negative application conditions, as you see here the, um, the red uh, arrow. And uh, the post condition is described by the right hand side of the rule. And this is the action which has taken place. Uh, and this is here the green arrow. So the customer has a card after um, this activity has ended. Um, yeah, let's have a look at the second activity, which is select good. And uh, here you see that in the precondition, uh, there has to be a customer which has, uh, who has a card and uh, there is a good in some rack. And after this activity has uh, finished, the good is in the card and not anymore in the rack. Then we have uh, the activity pay bill. And uh, this is a larger one. <laughs> so we have a quite a complex setting as precondition. The customer has a card and a bag and um, uh, yeah, shall pay a bill. So the bill is already there and also pay the pays relation. And um, in the card, there are goods. These are actually multi objects uh, written by several cards, one after the other. And um, the goods are listed on the bill and they are owned by the shop. And after paying the bill, uh, the goods are carried in the bag and the customer owns the goods and the goods are not owned anymore by the shop and they are not anymore in the card. Yeah. So this means the customer puts all the goods uh, from the card in his or her bag. So uh, as I said, goods is a multi object. So this is actually not just one rule, but um, you can consider it as a set of rules where um, depending on the instance graph, the right rule is selected. So for example, if the customer has uh, three goods in the card, then the rule with three goods is selected and um, 
the customer pays a bill for exactly three goods. There is some concept in the graph transformation theory for these kinds of rules. It's called amalgamated rules, or amalgamation of rules, um, but I will not go into details here now. So let's have a look at the other use case, uh, the selling of um, goods. And also here we have three activities. And the first activity create bill um, yeah, takes a customer and a shop and uh, creates a bill for this customer uh, and the shop. Uh, then we have the activity bill good. Um, we consider all the good, no, no, we consider one good which is carried in a cart by the customer, which belongs to the customer. And uh, this good is set onto the bill. And uh, you also see that uh, here the attributes are changing. So the total sum of the bill is uh, enlarged by um, the value of the good. And then we also have a settle bill. And uh, here we have a shop and uh, the shop has a cash box. And the shop owns a lot of goods, all the goods that are on the bill, which is, has been made out by the shop. And after the bill has been settled, so uh, you see that the total of the cash box is changing. Um, the goods do not belong any longer to the shop, but they um, are carried in a bag. So, and also this rule is actually a rule scheme dependent on the number of goods. Now, after uh, describing all the pre and post conditions of the activities, we can ask again our question, are these two views consistent with each other? Or are they somewhere in conflict? Are dependent on each other. There might be a cycle depend cyclic dependency. Yeah. So, yeah. How do we uh, find out? Actually, uh, we can first start with some um, concrete uh, situation. The start state here in the middle, in the upper row. And uh, for example, for this one, we apply um, the rule payable, or we, we also should say uh, we um, execute uh, the, the activity payable on one hand, or the um, activity settable on the other hand, and um, see what uh, we get uh, after execution. And um, already for this, uh, for this small example, it's not so easy to see if there are, is a conflict. Um, we would have a conflict in the case that after executing pay bill, set the execution of settle bill is not uh, possible anymore or the other way around. And uh, let's see, so, um, looking at um, the left hand side, um, applying payable, we see that uh, in the lower left corner here, um, the two goods are owned by the customer now and not owned by the shop anymore. And uh, applying settle bill, uh, they have to be owned by the shop. So there is um, some, some conflict. And uh, actually both rules um, delete uh, the owns edges uh, from shop to good. Yeah. So if we have a look at the, uh, do you see? No, we do not see it here. I have to go back. Here, you see settle bill um, deletes the owns edge of the between the shop and the goods. And 
Ja. Ähm. Here. Uh, you see that also payable deletes the owns edge between shop and good. So both delete this, and this leads to a, a conflict between these two executions. This is just one example. So what we can uh, see here is um, yeah, that there might be some that there might be some uh, conflicts between activities uh, in uh, one use case or in, in the other. And uh, so this would be a critical situation. Yeah. And what we want to do now is um, to check in general the consistency between the dynamic and functional aspects. And uh, the idea is um, to check without going through all the possible uh, instance um, graphs we, we could have, uh, just by looking at the rules, if there are some critical or favorable signs for uh, the consistency between these two rules or activities. Yeah. And uh, this means here, for example, um, if we have a situation where rule B is, uh, should be applied after rule A, uh, but rule A may conflict with rule B, then we would have a critical sign for consistency. And uh, if rule B uh, should be applied according uh, to rule A and uh, B can be uh, dependent on A, then that would be a favorable sign. And, um, yeah, so what we like to do now is that independent of uh, specific instance graphs, we want to consider um, possible potential conflicts and dependencies between rule applications um, to find these uh, yeah, signs of consistency or inconsistencies. So, and Here's a bit of theory uh, to um, back that. And the idea is here that we find a conflict between, or a potential conflict between two rules in the following sense. A rule R is potentially, uh, potentially causes a conflict with rule um, R2. If there is a pair of uh, transformations um, from G to H1 with R1 and from G to H2 with R2, so that T1 deletes an element that uh, is needed by T2, or T1 generates an element that prohibits a negative application condition in T2, or T1 changes an attribute value that is used in T2. Yeah. So uh, what we like to do is to find uh, such, um, such pairs of um, transformations so that uh, yeah, these kinds of conflicts um, are shown. And similar also for dependencies, here we consider another situation where First, um, rule R is applied, and we go from G to H, and then we apply thereafter rule two, R2, uh, and get uh, graph X. So we have a sequence of uh, two transformations, and um, rule R2 is potentially dependent on rule R1. If there is such a transformation sequence, so that um, by a T1, an element is generated which uh, needs um, T2, or, or which is needed by T2. Um, or T1 deletes an element uh, that um, is prohibited by a negative application condition in T2. 
or T1 changes in attribute values that is used in T2. Okay, um, let's have a look at the example again. So here uh, we see the two activity diagrams again and uh, see some yeah, red arrows, which uh, should show that uh, there are potential conflicts. And uh, so, for example, between payable and settable, we had considered uh, the example before, and we found out that both delete uh, owns edges, uh, which is a potential conflict, because when it is a uh, the owns edit of the same uh, good, then um, yeah, only one rule application can do that, and the other one is then too late. And uh, so the question is here, what potential conflicts can occur? And uh, yeah, so let's have a look, a closer look to this pair here. Now here we see the two rules again, and uh, we see that both uh, delete the owns edges. And uh, what else? No, I do not see any further problem here. Um, yeah, and the question is, um, how can we change this situation? Yeah, so how can we uh, solve this conflict? Yeah, we have to, uh, we could change um, the two rules. So for example, we could say, okay, um, when paying the bill, um, the good is, um, no longer carried in the card, but is carried in the bag. So the carries edge is deleted, but not the owns edges. And uh, but when um, executing settle bill, uh, we change, no, we delete the owns edges, but we will not put the goods into a bag. So we see here both um, activities overlap in common, uh, sub activities and we have to um, yeah divide them in, in, into uh, two distinct parts so to say so for example it can look like this here um, oh and this is actually a little bit different than I said <laughs> yeah so here but it also works uh, here we have um, changed paid bill and settle bill in, in the way that um, pay bill, yeah, just inserts, here's the owns edge and, and the carries edge and uh, settle bill deletes the owns edge and um, the carries edge edges. So doing this in that way, um, the conflict would be solved. But this is not the only way to do it. Yeah, so um, you could also think of um, solving the conflicts by defining the use case in a different way. You could also think of um, defining three use cases instead of uh, two. Uh, for example, first buying goods, this is done by customer, then billing goods, this is done by the seller as a clock, and then paying the bill uh, where both roles um, have to synchronize. So this could also be a solution. Let's have a look at the potential dependencies which can occur here. So, and we see um, take card, for example, takes a card and the card is needed to select a good. So there is some um, potential dependency between take card and select good. 
and pay bill needs some goods and select goods uh, select the goods so there's also some dependencies um, and similar on the right hand side so you see here some some green arrows um, which are favorable signs because the potential dependencies run along the control flow you see also some critical signs um, because there are also some potential dependencies between the use cases in both directions. Yeah. So for billing goods, you need uh, the customer needs a card. So the take card is um, is needed for that. So there's a dependency. Um, also the goods have to be in the card. So it's another dependency. And billing good is uh, yeah needed to to pay the bill in the end. So there's a dependency in the other direction. Um, the graph transformation theory has um, some results such that uh, this conflict and dependency analysis can be done automatically. And actually the, the Henshin system and also the HEG system, they can do that for you. And uh, so that you do not have to have it, have to do it by hand. And once you have done it for all the rules that are needed or that are used in your um, model, then uh, you can, yeah, list them up in, in, in so now you can show them in, in some kind of dependency graph like this one here. Or even I will show you in, in some minutes, I will show you also a, a slightly more um, refined um, way to, to show conflicts and dependencies. But before, I want to talk about the good and critical signs of this uh, conflict and dependency analysis. And uh, this uh, yeah, is uh, summarized in, in a table here. You see, a table uh, where you see on the left hand side if uh, two activities have a conflict or no conflict or dependency or no dependency and in the columns you see if the activities are in control flow so this means if you have um, activity a and b they are in control flow a um, first a and then b or against the control flow, then it's the other way around, or in no control flow. Yeah, so especially when you have uh, the activities in two different use cases, then they are not in a, in, in a control flow. And uh, you see all the combinations here. So for example, having a conflict between two uh, rules that are uh, in control flow. So this means we have the rules A and B, and uh, we have first A, then B in the control flow, and A can cause a conflict with B, then this is critical. Yeah. Um, if A cannot cause conflict with B, then this is a good sign, a favorable sign. Um, if we have, yeah, consider uh, the situation against control flow, so um, B first B and then A, and A causes a conflict with B, then never mind. Yeah. And A cannot cause a conflict, and it's also yeah, not interest, not really interesting. <laughs> and um, when both are not in control flow dependence, then um, if A causes a conflict on or can cause a conflict on B, this is a critical sign. If it cannot cause a conflict, then it's a good sign. Yeah. And we can do something similar uh, also for dependencies. And here we can say, okay, once the dependencies are um, along the control flow, this is a good sign. Otherwise it's yeah, a critical one. Yeah, this is more or less what we can say here. And um, if A and B are not in control for dependence, then um, B 
can be dependent on A. Uh, this is critical. Uh, if B cannot be dependent on A, then this is a good sign. Okay, so summarizing, we use um, the theory of uh, conflict and dependency analysis here um, to find out favorable and critical signs of consistency between uh, control flow and causal dependencies of activities, which are described by rules. Um, once we have done this for dependencies, for example, and here we see um, a diagram where the dependencies, the interdependencies between two use cases are shown. Uh, we can also show what the dependency reason is. And if you look closer here, you see in the middle um, some object structure and especially some, some um, references between customer and card and card and good and so. And those are in red because they um, cause the dependencies between different activities. So for example, take card creates uh, the reference between customer and card, which is used by Bill Good, or uh, which is also used by select good. And select good creates um, the reference between card and good, which is also used by Bill Good and so on. Yeah, so the dependency reasons show uh, the objects and references that explain the potential dependencies that might occur. And they can be compared with activity diagrams with object flow. So maybe we have seen them in another context. Okay, so let's uh, summarize. We have talked about uh, detecting inconsistent uh, requirements and um, First, we talked about the specification of requirements, uh, which is usually given in natural language. And uh, the first step we do for detecting inconsistencies is to translate them into a model. And the model consists of uh, class diagrams to describe the static structures, um, of activity diagrams to describe the dynamics, and of pre and post conditions to describe the functionality of the activities and they are presented represented in rules and um, throughout this talk we looked at inconsistencies between the control flow and causal dependencies of pre and post conditions of these activities and we use conflict and dependency analysis um, to find these inconsistencies yeah so this all is possible um, when we consider refined activity diagrams where activities are refined by rules, actually, by transformation rules. And we can do the specification of um, those refined activity diagrams, which are also a kind of controlled rule applications. And we can uh, perform the conflict and dependency analysis with engine. And here you see the URL to use engine. So you have some tool at hand. Yeah, and that finishes um, the overview on uh, chapter five. And um, if you want to read more, then yeah, let's have a look at the book. And yeah, I'm finished. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Gabi. Good timing as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, I know these things to some extent, but but um, I was wondering um, just what is the latest. Um... Right. Okay. So maybe we let let me take a step back. So so if you want to use these things in practice, then they need tool support that is kind of working together with the tools that people use in modeling these these things in the first place. So. You said we have activity diagrams. We have these, uh, uh, the, obviously, the, the, the transformation rules that describe the actions in the 
um, the activities basically. Obviously, we have class diagrams. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of a tool that would support all of these things and then sort of be able to, to um, do the kind of analysis uh, uh, based on that. So, what is your, I mean, what, so, so I'm not asking you is there's a tool is, if there's a tool that does that because I know there isn't but but I would be interested in understanding sort of your 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 view on this so so how how would one go about building such a tool if you wanted to do that and what sort of what 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 would you use in, in what what kind of tool chain would you set up for that so actually for some parts there is tooling so for example hmm. uh, based on natural language processing there is tooling to um, get from a natural language description of requirements to class diagrams, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I'm not aware of a tool that um, uh, provides you with activity diagrams based on natural language processing, but I could also imagine that because you can also analyze the, the text and um, look for something like first do this and then do that or if this then that and so on. So all the control flow, um, uh, yeah, the control flow can in some sense be deduced from the text. Yeah. And um, but uh, I, I right, right now, so by heart, I do not know tooling uh, mm -hmm. that does it. That, that, sorry, sorry, that, sorry to drop. I mean that is a. Uh... That just gave me an interesting thought. So, so could we derive graph transformation rules from such descriptions? Natural yeah, this is what step? I wanted to say. This would okay. be the third step. So uh, once you would have uh, the, the activity diagrams, then you uh, also would like to have the refined activity diagrams. And uh, this would mean to deduce uh, graph transformation um, rules from the text. And I mean, uh, you have done it um, in a way that you deduce from from Java programs these uh, rules, yeah, <laughs> visual contracts, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. so this might also be possible. But this is something which is definitely missing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's an interesting task for the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I know of work in um, in Birmingham, Bezat Bortba, a PhD student of his, maybe five years ago or more. They did work on generating OCL constraints from natural language descriptions, but they were kind of structured descriptions. So they were not just free text, but somehow restricted, mm -hmm. restricted text in a way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, the, the used techniques of natural language processing are also quite powerful. So I think there's yeah, something. Yeah possible yeah. yeah so this is something which uh, need to be done yeah and once we have all that then we could uh, apply the um, conflict and dependency analysis yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so this would be the the tool chain in principle <laughs> yeah okay okay mm -hmm. i mean you could enter the the rules and the class diagram and the activity diagram directly in a, in a in an editor in principle yeah mm -hmm. but then you have to do it by hand yeah, yeah. So then, then it is a manual task. Of course, somebody can can read the the text and and then try to deduce uh, the rules from the text uh, manually. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, actually, this is not. Uh, we would like to have to automate this. <laughs> of yeah, course, yeah. we are computer scientists. <laughs> okay. Mm. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Let me check the chat. I don't see anything here. I don't see any. Yeah, but there's a hand raising. Oh, yeah, Nick, Nick, Nick has his hand up. Please go ahead, Nick. Thanks. Um, thanks, Gabi, for the very nice talk. And I was just wondering, there was this one moment in your example where you have essentially, there's a loop, uh, unspecified loop at some point. And I guess one of the conflicts, which is more difficult to show, is that, um, I mean, you, you presumably don't want that somebody takes three goods but only pays for two. No, So, so I feel that th this is presumably more almost like a grammar conflict, no? because essentially, uh, if there's a rule that allows you to leave without paying all the goods, that would be so. We also so, so I was just wondering, and in, in terms of graph rewriting, 
uh, is there a way to to ensure the writing system will never allow this sort of malicious behavior and presumably you will insert you mean a, uh, you mean this loop here in uh, for bill good for example exactly because it's an um, unspecified loop you could have like 10 or 100 goods uh, yes um so uh yeah in this uh, chapter we <laughs> we we jumped over <laughs> the chapter three. Uh, we talk about uh, control structures for rule application, and right. there's also one uh, which is called as long as possible. So as as long as you find mm -hmm. goods in in your card, you would apply bill good to get all the goods on the on the bill in the end. Right, right, yeah. But there would have to be something. One, I mean, if one wanted to, I, I guess the application scenario would be you want to design a system that is error free in the sense doesn't allow malicious behavior you would have to somehow endow it with some sort of this sort of fixed point logic no what is it yeah you, i mean these these activity diagrams here they are not not that pre precise in in that mm -hmm. way yeah and um, so we have to interpret these these loops here what what do they really mean and maybe mm -hmm. we have different kinds of loops in the end yeah. And uh, yeah, it depends also on the requirements description. So what, what is written there? Is there written something like as long as possible? Right. Or, or what is written there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to comment quickly on this natural language processing because I recently um, uh, watched a talk by Bob Cook on, on this, um, you know, on the Topaz Institute colloquium. And I think they made some enormous progress in terms of what they can extract from natural language as structured mm -hmm. data. So they have this sort of mm -hmm. string diagrammatic way of, uh, I think that might be worth having a look at if it's useful enough to to actually get to graph writing rules because they made some really nice advantage, advances. I think mm -hmm. they might have even a tool for this, how to pre-process natural language into these sort of diagrammatic presentations of relationship and so on. So I was just thinking that might be an interesting direction. Yeah, possibly. this might be interesting. So yeah. Altogether, this might be interesting for, for um, research project in the end, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Sorry, how is this called, Nicholas? Is, is this the, the, the kind of the quantum natural language processing thing that they it, do? It started out from this whole uh, ZX calculus type work, but I mean, Bob has been doing this for years, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. for at least 10, 15 years. And it's also Valeria Di Balva, I think. If I Could you write it into this chat? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let me just find the link actually to the to the talk. <laughs> okay, that would be helpful. Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the quantum was just that the, the string diagrams they use are basically similar to the ones that they use for quantum computing or for specifying quantum computing mm -hmm. in some way or the other. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I always go, I, I got confused about this a little bit, but I think it basically just means that this, I mean, the string diagrams are essentially a special form of graph. Uh, that mm -hmm. they to represent so graphs with some additional features or constraints and um, they are useful both for the representing quantum computing programs and it, as it happens also for natural language uh, it just basically means that graphs in certain forms are useful things to to model mm -hmm. different types of things so i don't think there's a deep connection between the quantum and the language Except that they both use graphs that are bit zip, that are similar. Mm -hmm. Is that I don't know. Is that what you understand as well, Nick? Um, yeah. May I? What's it like to sure, learn? Sure. That? <laughs> yeah, oh no! Actually, the, the situation is a bit messy because uh, uh, you know basically you have a notion of uh, sharing and sharing on graphs. Huh? You have edges and you can share and share. And in uh, ZX and the other calculus, basically you have two different notions of sharing and sharing. So it's uh, it's a bit a bit more messier than just uh, than just graphs, basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they did so they don't use the same type of string diagram, basically. In, 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 in... Oh, well, the fact is that in string diagram you can have um, connect. Com you, you know that you have uh, the components which connect. Uh, various uh, things, right? Various, uh, ed various nodes. And uh, something which should be the duplicator connector, you have two kind of duplicator. One for something and the other for something else. Don't ask me what, but uh, that's more or less the, 
the idea. Okay. You have more notion of uh, sharing instead of the one that you have just on graphs, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. only one. Is, is, is it like the one that is the mutex and the other one that is the... Kind of, yes, exactly. exactly. So it's, one is the choice and the other one is the synchronization. It's like kind of, exactly. One is like an exactly. end and the other one is like an or, let's maybe if you put it like that. Yeah, yeah, precisely uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And how does this help here? I, I cannot get the connection. Oh, so, so it's it's interesting that nowadays uh, with the latest version of these calculi for natural language processing, you have um, much more structured connectors, for example, that really can understand the grammar of a sentence. So the idea is, as you said, you wanted to extract from a sentence whether certain things influence other things or must come before or and, and, and this is a sort of thing in Bob's talk where he gives an update on what's currently possible. I mean, what sort of relationship can you extract from natural language mm -hmm. and how can you represent it efficiently? So I found it quite interesting how far this goes. I mean, it's, it's, it's more than just saying you have a noun and a, and a verb. It is really, um, they have sort of oh interesting ways of, you know. And the other thing is that it's sort of, there's a certain level of verification in that if you want to have a thing that asks for before and after, then you have to provide a before and after. So, I mean, if you match that to a sentence, then you can check whether really the consistency is there for that particular connector. So I think the quality of statements they get from machine learning or however they do this on natural mm -hmm. language has gotten much better. And so mm -hmm. I wonder if it's good enough to actually get to your, um, your type of, of, of diagrams, mm -hmm. whether that is what one would get from, from these tools. But uh, I, I don't know much about it. I just watched this talk, which I thought was... Okay. I mean, the standard tool is the Stanford Natural Language Processor. Um, yeah. It's a, a tool from Stanford, and um, this is what is uh, very often used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it can do a lot of different analysis of, um, of the text uh, with respect to grammar. Yeah. And, and this can be used. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I think it's reference in this talk. I, I forgot who was the author of this uh, tool. They have something. Um, I think their particular angle is that they want to do that on a quantum computer. I mean, run the actual natural language processing on a quantum computer. So maybe. Oh, I see. Okay. That was maybe the maybe it's a different line of work then. Yeah. yeah. No, but so, I mean, I just meant that the structure of things they get from natural language is really fantastic. I mean, they. Mm -hmm. It might be, might be strong enough for these sort of scenarios where you describe a protocol and you know already it's a protocol of actions. Yeah. Anyways. The problem is more than um, it's difficult to to have tooling that uh, deduces uh, a model from that. So um, there are a lot of work done in, for natural language processing, but for different purpose, purposes, mm -hmm. not for for deducing a model. Right. Uh, but um, for understanding commands or something like that, uh, that you can talk with your computer or do something like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, and, and this is, a, yeah, then, then the natural language processor has um, different um, advantages and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, you probably have to think of this, and I'm sure this is what people do in two stages, isn't it? So, one is a kind of parsing. Um, and analyzing of the of the natural language, then you get some abstract representation of that, which presumably in this case would be a string diagram. So basically a diagrammatic or, or sort of graphical representation. And then there is a kind of generation process where you take that representation and generate out of it whatever you whatever you need. Yeah. So mm -hmm. so so clearly, uh, uh, I mean, if you have a and if you have a structure that describes the, the some some to some extent the logic of the text that you're that you're, you're that you've been given as an input, um, it's still a question basically what what do you generate out of that? Do you generate? I mean, you, maybe you can make a class diagram out of it. Maybe you can make um, uh, uh, yeah, as you say, an activity diagram out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that meets whether that needs certain assumptions on the text in the first place, whether you have to um, organize the text in a certain way so that it makes sense to create either one of these things. Yeah, but you also need a lot of analysis uh, techniques, which are uh, usually uh, provided by the natural language processor, and it depends on what you want to create, uh, what kind of analysis you do in the beginning. Uh, so. 
Yeah, but this is the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, I don't know if there are no more questions at the moment, then I would say, oh, let me find my chat again. Um, so then, yeah, I would close the official part of the, the seminar now. And, and so that means we disconnect from YouTube and stay between ourselves if you want to have a sort of a little chat afterwards. So thank you very much again, Gabi. And we may continue this because there are a couple of sort of interesting chapters left in the book that we can talk about. Um, right. <laughs> uh, but we don't have a particular schedule. So we take it sort of potentially on demand uh, to, to, to continue the series. And then maybe we can put it together in the, in the, in the, on the, on the similar page on a, in a, in a, in a series of talks there, if you want to do that. All you right. So maybe, sorry. may I, yeah. You find uh, th these slides and a lot of uh, further material on the um, website here, which is below, uh, graph transformation for software engineering.org, if you're interested. And, and, and the book, and, and the PDF of the actual book as well. Right. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, Nick, do you want to briefly announce the next um, seminar? Yeah. yeah, so first of all, also, thanks a lot, Gavi, and uh, for everybody who might be still on YouTube, might wish to join us for sort of the private part of the chat, just uh, do, do come on, on Zoom. We will stay maybe for a moment. Um, and we will have next week a presentation by Ambras Lafont on a tool with which you can uh, draw commutative diagrams, such as the ones we do in graph transformation theory, and then, you know, ex uh, parse from it cock code for this cock proof assistant. So, I mean, it's the first step towards uh, graphically doing proofs. Um, yes, and I mean, it's more of a workshop session. It's not so much a talk. There's a really a small presentation, but this will be mostly be a workshop session, but everybody is invited. And yes, so thanks a lot, Gavi. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And I'll, I'll just close uh, 